Elter, Integrated European Long-Term Ecosystem, Critical Zone, and Socio-Ecological Research. Okay, so welcome everybody for this November's first SPF uh, webinar. Uh, today we will hear about the TA program and we have just opened the, the fourth TA call, so this is really timely timely moment for this uh, this uh, webinar. And we will first hear the introduction of the of the program, how does it work from Ulf and Tudor, Ulf Malast and Tudor Rako B. I oh, know I cannot pronounce your name, sorry. Um, and then we will have uh, uh, two TA users, uh, Alexandra Hillebrand Vojkulescu and Kevin Manga, uh, who will who will talk to us about the experiences of visiting an, an elder site. And um, you can put your questions during the presentations to the to the chat, and then we will have in the end of, of the presentations more, more open time for questions and answers what you might have. Uh, if there's not any questions uh, at the moment, I think we can get started and give the floor to Ulf and Tudor. All right. Thank you, Terhi. Um, yeah, well, uh, also a warm welcome from my side, or from our side, from Tudor Hatrobecianu, which is the last name, um, um, and me, of course, as well, uh, Ulf Malas. I'm the lead of the TAI program, um, and Tudor is within the management team of the same program, and we are both assisted by Herbert Howard from the EAA in Austria. Um, this this um, webinar today is there to just introduce and announce the program itself and at the end also to answer questions that you might have when you come across this kind of uh, call the fourth call now uh, and you may want to um, apply for for the program and some funding you may have some questions and at the end we have of course a, a slot where we have this kind of dedicated question answer um, possibility for us um, maybe I start with a very general uh, question. Why does Elter actually offer an access scheme? So it's actually quite quite um, quite clear, at least to us. Elter Plus opens, or with the access scheme, wants to open up the Elter Research Infrastructure, so the Elter RI. Uh, it also wants to offer free of charge opportunities to perform research at selected sites. And of course, we want also want to um, or aim to attract a wide range of users from various disciplines. And at the end, we also need, of course, to or we, we address this kind of uh, access scheme to both multinational teams of researchers, but also for individual researchers. It could also be from SMEs, for example, small and medium inter enterprises. So there's not only a bound to um, research, it could also be quite industry focused. Um, what we want to have is small to medium, also scale ecological, social, social ecological projects. So both ecological and social ecological would be would be focused uh, and again it could be one thing one side you are trying to to not trying you are visiting or it could be multiple multiple sites within the same uh, application i mentioned here selected sites and um, before i really go on with the with the presentation i want to use this chance to also thank uh, all the institutions who actually host the sites we are offering in the transnational access program there are quite a few. You see here all the locus of those um, host institutions on the right hand side. And those who are here, I've seen some. Uh, again, it's really, really, uh, it's a big thanks to you that we want to address here uh, to you. And we are quite, great, uh, quite grateful uh, for you offering your sites, for you offering your professional cooperation, for your support, of course, for your motivation to help the users, and also, of course, for your kindness. So without you, again, I said last time, I will do it again and we'll do it probably several more times in the future. Without you, the TAI program would not really exist. So it's really um, up to you, basically, or it's up to us to thank you. Um, and it's based on, on your cooperation. What did we do so far? We had three calls that are con have been conducted in the past. We had uh, 48 proposals that have been accepted. We had 29 sites within those proposals that have been visited. visited. We had 17 of um, countries um, that have, have been involved and we also had hmm, uh, so far a budget of 824,000 euros spent and we had a total of 131 users so far so it's quite some impressive numbers 
But with the fourth and the fifth call that's going to be uh, launched in next November, uh, we want to increase all those numbers, of course. The fourth, fourth call has been opened and launched last week on the 1st of, April, uh, 1st of November, of course. It will be open until the 31st of January next year. Uh, you probably have seen this, this flyer here um, on the, um, on the uh, social media channels we have. Uh, this time we open 43, so all the sites we have, um, sites um, that you can apply for. Um, again, you have a chance to, either to use um, this flyer here that links you all directly to our websites or to use um, the website itself. Um, I will come to that in a few seconds. Just some information regarding um, the background and the timeline. Again, as I said before, the, the deadline of this call is going to be the January, January 31st of next year. Then the call closes. And then we initiate a three-step um, procedure to check the proposals. Um, those three steps are first the eligibility check, which means um, Tudor and me uh, are checking just the formal criteria that, it, that they are met. Um, then there's going to be the possibility check. So um, the, your proposals will go to the site managers. They will check uh, if what you have planned is really feasible within their uh, their sites. And then at the end, we have also this the scientific evaluation. So we have a, um, a, um, a team that is um, made of or consisting of uh, internal and external experts from l but also from uh, outside l -Term. Your proposals will then be sent to those teams uh, and will then be evaluated by them. Uh, at the end, which is the March 31st next year, the outcome of this uh, three-step evaluation process is going to be communicated to you as the applicants. And then uh, when it's positive, of course, you can start right away with your, with your campaigns, with your plans, with your um, endeavors. Um, we have put here March 31st, 25 as the end of your projects. Um, this is going to be just you know, a rough indication of what you have, of what we want to have. Um, if you plan, for example, also a multi-seasonal um, campaign, which could be like two summers, for example, uh, it could also go until um, the end of 25. Since I've said before to Kevin in the beginning of this uh, of this call. Um, the entire TRA program is bound to two projects, the elder projects. Um, both will run until March, uh, until January 26th. That means we cannot accept, of course, any any end that is beyond that. So we re really encourage you to stop or to to plan your your projects until let's say mid or end 25. Uh, so that make would make sense to also have a certain time for for uh, evaluating and also for dissemination your dissemitting your your results. Mm. What I want to say as well is um, it's always quite, or we encourage you at least to to really have or get in contact with the site manager right away. So before even um, writing your proposals, just to let them know uh, what who you are, what you want to do, to involve them directly, to ask them questions, if that this or that is possible at their sites. Um, that would make this kind of second step here, the possibility check, way easier for your proposal. And it would also give you the chance to, to get to know who is your counterpart at the sites and um, what they have and what don't have. <clears throat> and when I talk about sites, uh, of course, um, I have mentioned before the 43 sites we're offering uh, all listed here. So that is actually a screenshot from the website um, from the TRA um, program. You see the map, you see also the site itself. Um, I would now like to just quickly um, invite you to follow me and I have to actually ah, that is something I have to do again. I'll just quickly share my entire screen for a moment. Um and now I need to find the correct the correct sorry for that. I should have actually practiced that and should have actually taken uh Tahi's offer to test. Um I'll just do it right away. So if you click on Eltai.eu, you find this find this right um, button up here. Find your research at your site, our sites. Um, you can you can see actually, you can see actually the part the sites to participate. Uh, I'm sorry for the noise. Uh, that's just simply my wife who's caring for me and who just brings um, a heater into a, a very cold room that I'm sitting in. Um, so if you click on the sites here, you see also um. The site name, you see this the country, 
and whether or not it's re offers remote or um, transactional or RET um, access. And you also have the link to Dimes. And when you click on Dimes as well, you will be deleted, no, you will guided to Dimes. And then you have here, of course, also information that goes beyond the simple name and the and uh, the country. It shows you also, of course, who's the site manager you can contact. It shows you the information that are gathered at the site and observed at the site. So that's quite a few things you can you have here, uh, and you can just browse through and um, explore. So I will jump back now to the presentation. Yes. Um, again, I was showing you actually the websites. Here it is again, and I invite you or we invite you to um, look at the different um, options we have here. We have also a fact section where you find certain questions that you may have as well. You find information on the background of the TAR access scheme. You find information on previous um, um, projects on the block and webinar. You find the main documents that should be also, um, well, at least looked at. And you find also a, a quite clear guideline on how to apply to the um, for project. To get there, you can either uh, scan the QR code or you can use simply the entire the entire um, uh, address. Or if you want to have, if you have any, any other question, you can also of course contact uh, uh, us with the TE minus RA at elter minus ri.eu, where that you will reach both Tudor and me. And we are, of course, always happy to answer any question. So with that, I am through with my part. Um, and I would actually hand over to uh, Kevin and, and to Alessandra, and also to Michai at the end, because you know both Kevin and Alessandra are the ones who have completed projects so far, uh, quite successfully. Uh, the one project is called Crestroads from Kevin. The other one is called Kevin Biodiff from Alessandra. Both will give an impression of what they have encountered, experienced um, with and through uh, the TRI program. And at the end, we also want to give you a certain impression from the uh, site and platform coordinator side. So someone who runs the site and what what they can tell us about uh, the TRI program and what brings it for them, basically. So with that, I would hand over to Kevin, maybe. And I have to stop sharing, of course, as well. Yes, uh, thanks all for, for inviting me to present some of the work we did uh, with my host in uh, Hungary. So I will uh, just uh, briefly give an overview of what uh, we did in uh, in uh, in Hungary during my visit in uh, in summer this year so my project was entitled uh, grassroots where i actually looked at uh, how root traits vary in a, restore, a typical restored uh, grassland system in uh, in hungary and uh, i was uh, actually hosted at the Center of Agricultural Research, and my contact person during that time was uh, Kathleen uh, Thorok. So I'll just give you a brief uh, overview of what uh, transpired there, what I did, and some of maybe results, so that at least you can have an idea of uh, what is it, what goes on during this uh, these visits. So this is just my brief uh, profile. You know, I'm currently based at uh, the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development in Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And I have uh, a background of soil science and uh, plant ecology. And I've worked in uh, different ecosystems, uh, be it the boreal forest in uh, Finland, where I did my postdoc, African island systems and the savannas. And uh, I have different kind of research interests. And for this particular call, I was mostly targeting to do an experiment or a research project dealing with the seed-based ecological uh, restoration and, uh, and rehabilitation. So as uh, Ulf has already, has already introduced the website of the ILTA Plus. So immediately I saw the call, I went to this uh, website and I, I started looking at what are some of the sites which are available in the, for participation in this particular call. And for my own interest, I was focused mostly on uh, grassland systems. So I looked at uh, what is there in Lazak, Kiskun, 
case constellation experiment and the uh, house yeah? i think it's in the uk then i just explored the different uh, pages to see what is what kind of ongoing research is there is it anything which is in line to what i'm also doing at the moment so after going through uh, the different uh, sites especially those ones for grassland i eventually settled for kiskun and uh, my host at, uh, at the ILTA site in uh, Kiskun was uh, Katalin Torok, and she we shared some uh, brief introduction of what I was I wanted to do with uh, during my research visit, and she also introduced me to some of uh, some of the PhD students, which she is uh, actually currently mentoring, Nora and uh, and Meso. Coincidentally, Meso is also from Kenya, where I come from, so it was a good uh, it was a good uh, coincidence to. At least work with the also a scientist back from uh, from home. So my sites were located in uh, the Ilta Ulofaza site in uh, in Hungary, and is is typically located in uh, in a sandy ridge where the soils are relatively very sandy, and the annual rainfall in this uh, study site is around uh, between 500 to 550 millimeters. Typical, like comparable to a semi arid environment back in, in Kenya, and the mean temperatures are ranging between 10 and 11 degrees centigrade annually. So, this was the team I was uh, who hosted me during my research visit after contacting them and sharing my idea. And uh, they were really helpful during my time there, and they belong to the restoration ecology group in, uh, in Hungary. So why did I choose uh, why did I choose the uh, the ILTA site in uh, in Kiskun? Because after going through the the website and uh, going through the different uh, projects which are currently running in uh, Kiskun, I came across this uh, interesting project where they are trying to look at how seed based restorations can be able to prevent the establishment of uh, the establishment establishment and uh, spread of uh, invasive species and for this particular site they are not looking at this uh, invasive species the common mil milkweed which is the Ascapelius seriaca uh, which has actually invaded uh, some of the grassland sites there so they are trying to see how can the seed based restoration initiatives can be used to be able to prevent the establishment and uh, spread of uh, this invasive species in the sunny grasslands in, in Hungary so it was a quite a good match for of, for my research interest, and uh, once I shared the idea with the, with my hosts in Hungary, they were also very excited to to host me and develop the concept much further to prepare it for submission to the call, which was uh, last year. So as you as you engage in as you start, you know, trying to apply for this uh, particular call. This is like the overview of uh, what to expect in the application uh, template. We'll be generally be asked about uh, you know, your general information, what is your title on, what is your research title, how is it linked to predefined research questions. We'll be given some uh, a place to either fill. If you're going alone as an applicant, you can only fill one. There's also, I think, a possibility of uh, going as a team one, two, three, depending on the kind of study. So you can fill all the details of the applicants in the in the project, either as an individual like myself, I went alone, or even as a team, maybe two or three people can be able to be funded also for this particular project. So then you also have the good news about is also a very brief, a very brief kind of uh, request form. You get uh, an opportunity to describe your project, some of the objectives which you want to achieve during the, the visit and uh, the methods you want to use and uh, what, uh, what is the kind of data which you want to collect for your, from, your, from your project. And again, you'll be given an opportunity to give like a, a rough estimate of uh, the travel costs which you might incur. And I think most of the costs and uh, expenses regarding accommodation will be, I think, some of be moderated with the, with the Host in the in the institute, 
where you'll be visiting. So why I was interested in this particular topic is that you know root rates in uh, grassland system play a, a very important role, uh, especially aspects of um, driving ecosystem processes. And uh, unfortunately, you no, know, not so much has been uh, studied in terms of how this uh, root traits can be actually be used to inform successful uh, restoration initiatives, especially in grassland systems. Because most of the studies which have been done previously have mostly looked at uh, what happens above ground and not so much of what happens below ground. And this is where most of the maybe ecosystem processes are uh, taking place. So I was interested to look at uh, actually going deeper into the root of restoration and trying to see how the different uh, functional traits, either morphological, architectural, or physiological traits, or biotic traits, vary under different uh, restoration treatments in uh, grassland in grassland systems. So this was the main motivation for my for my for my project, which I conducted in uh, in Hungary. So this was the site which was uh, which I visited, and uh, this is, this was the, the layout where there are several you know treatments and blocks. And my objectives for this uh, visit was to determine uh, root functional traits changes after restoration compared to no seeding in an old abandoned field and also in a grassland reference site which is nearby the restoration sites. And also, I was also interested to establish the relationship between the measured uh, root functional traits and how this is linked to soil and above ground plant morphological characteristics. So these were the two main uh, objectives which I looked at during my, my visit in, uh, in Hungary in, uh, over, over the summer period. So this is just a brief overview of how the sites look like. The first one was like the reference grassland, which is somehow semi-natural. The second was like an abandoned oil field. The third one is the site which has been restored by Festuca, one of the grass species which has been used, which is still live. And in the fourth, in the fourth photo on the left, you can see there is also a dieback because of I think extreme drought during the establishment period. Some of the Festuca grasses died off. So this formed the kind of treatments for my research visit and compare how the root functional traits vary in these uh, different treatments. So these are some of the methods I used. You did some uh, treatments, identification, and doing some marking. I also did some plant identification and uh, doing some clipping to estimate biomass. We did some soil and uh, root sampling at the top, uh, top uh, 10 centimeters. And we did uh, image uh, kind of analysis using the rise of vision to see, to quantify the different root functional traits. And thereafter, I looked at the relative uh, abundance of these uh, established grasses and the other forbs compared to the invasive uh, species, which you can see in the slide, in the photo, number six. And in the photo number seven, you can see the two species have been seeded, Festuca, the grass, and the uh, Behind the cellular, this is a fog which were established during the establishment period. So some of the some of the last results which uh, we found during the visit was that above ground biomass aspects of plant cover were relatively much higher in uh, the sites which had still uh, mis the festuca vaginata still growing. But in the old abandoned site, there was a lot of uh, species richness. This can be attributed to you know, maybe lack of disturbance and a lot of uh, maybe seed bank, which is still uh, available in the old uh, abandoned sites. And you could also see a lot of uh, strong relationship between plant cover and biomass yields of the sites and species richness, also how it was related with the biomass and also plant cover. So this was what we did uh, measure above ground and we saw how the species uh, how the treatments varied within the different kind of uh, treatments we also saw that uh, the relative abundance of the invasive species was relatively much higher in the old site compared to the reference so it means that the 
initiatives to restore this uh, grasslands contributed to much less uh, percentage of invasive species compared to the old site, which was relatively not uh, seeded with any kind of uh, preferred species. And the relative abundance of the Festuca vaginata and the Diacanthus thyrotus was uh, relatively higher in uh, the live uh, and also in the sites which had uh, the bed dieback of uh, the, the Festuca vaginata. This might be because, for example, of the competition. And even when there's less competition, then the Dianthus serratus was relatively much more in abundant. So you could see that there's also aspects of how different uh, species of plants have been receded vary in the, in the treatment sites. He also looked at how things uh, were below ground, the root functional traits, and uh, the root length and the root tissue density were relatively higher in the live, uh, the sites which are the living uh, Festuca, Vaginata. And this can be attributed to, can be an indicator of uh, infertility of these soils. So the grasses uh, and the roots are trying to spread out to be able to get nutrients and uh, resources to be able to grow, compared to the reference sites, which are relatively much lower. And this shows that at least maybe those sites are relatively much uh, have uh, a nutrient availability compared to the other sites. And you can see in the lower lower panel C and D, it was like the reverse. Because these are somehow you not know, trying to see how the plant economics of above ground are related to what is happening uh, below ground. And uh, it was very clear that the live, uh, the live, uh, the sites with the living uh, festuca had relatively much less a specific root area and a specific root length compared to the reference site, which had relatively much, we assume that they have uh, much more fertile compared to the, which are being restored. So these were some of the traits which we, we, we were able to compare. And this is just still uh, some preliminary results which we want to use to compare with uh, what happens when you compare the soil properties. And uh, this is the last, you know, regarding what happens below ground again, you see in the live uh, plots, there was a lot of you know, root length, number of tips also relatively high, the branching points. So this was a, a good indicator that these sites are relatively uh, maybe lacking in terms of uh, nutrient availability or they have been depleted so that, that because of the more biomass of uh, plants, so they're trying to reach out eh, uh, to get more, uh, to get additional nutrients in terms of uh, in nutrients or uh, water. So they spread out far and wide to be able to access these resources. And from the graphs, this one and the other presented, you can see that there's a lot of uh, difference between how this uh, ecological uh, traits vary in these uh, restored uh, sites. So after work, you know, we also had, I had an opportunity to visit some uh, other sites also some uh, farming areas. And where I was, where I was uh, accommodated is, they have a very beautiful ecological, uh, botanical garden, which I was able to visit and just uh, hang around after, after work. So that was uh, what I wanted to present and share today. And I would like to acknowledge these uh, partners or you know, supporters of the project. And uh, I hope you have maybe appreciated how some of these things happen in, the, in this program. So I think I'll stop there for, for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, there's one question in the chat. Maybe we can take that on that point before moving to Alexandra, although I said differently. So uh, Laura is asking, what do you call in this study the reference grassland? Not treated, and if so, for how long? Okay. Hey. So the the reference site for this particular for, for this particular sites is a semi-natural grassland, which is next to the sites which have been which have been uh, restored with receding. So this is the, the reference site, and the control site was uh, one of the abandoned fields, which was abandoned but was not treated by this uh, seed-based restoration treatments. 
either the Testoka Vaginata and the other forms which were used to restore. Okay, thanks, Ulf. Just briefly, let me follow up on one of the slides of Kevin. Uh, I have no Kevin, no question for you, Kevin, uh, but yeah. you you had a perfect kind of um, um, intro to what we have changed from your call to the next new call. So you showed in your slides the old application um, application forms which are actually based on a doc doc uh, document. Yeah, that has now been changed to an online submission portal. So yeah. um, I would just briefly can share my screen to just give you this uh, insight of how that looks now. The questions are the same. So the, the entire thing that, that Kevin was talking about before are the same. It's just simply now online and, and uh, submission based. Uh, so everything has been asked for can be filled in here. Uh, and at the end, oh, hold on, before you actually get to there, you get there by just hitting the apply now button, of course, right? And then you get to this kind of online submission portal. Uh, and then you are having to fill in everything, a single field here uh, for first part, um, the general section. So what is your title, uh, your project title, um, the number of users you plan to to have with that, the access mode, keywords, all those kind of things. And then um, information about you yourself as applicants. And then the last part is any general project description part. So what you want to do, um, when it's performed, uh, data to be obtained, all those kind of things. So that is now again, Online, if you encounter any, because it's rather, rather new still, if you encounter any, um, I don't know, any bug or something, again, drop us a note at the TARA uh, at altra-ri.eu um, address, and then we will help you, of course. So thank you. Thank you. That's a good reminder of, about the little changes that has happened. And I think then we continue for the next example of, of already happened. TA visits. Alexandra, please. You are still muted. Yeah. Now I now I now we hear you well. You you can hear me. Uh this one. Okay. So I will uh, walk you through through the entire process of uh, and so the experience we had on uh, with uh, with this uh, TA RGA mission which was a joy for us um so i will talk about the eris and jess Eldag TA mission on pianosa island eris is my institute the institute of uh, speleology emil Gakovic institute of speleology which is one of the Romanian academies institutes of research um, and we also had a member of the JESS, which is the group of uh, for underwater and speleological exploration with us. Um, JESS is an um, environmental NGO. And in between Eris and JESS, there is a written partnership. So we are helping each other in many occasions with uh, in the frame of uh, various projects. So uh, this is the team. Um, Raluca Bancila from my institute, uh, who is actually the head of the Department of uh, Biospeleology, my direct chief. Catalina Haido, who is a PhD student uh, preparing her, her last steps uh, before defending her thesis, hopefully in February next year. Uh, also from, uh, from the institute. And uh, Vlad Vajkulescu, he is a very valuable uh, person at Jess, and I'm not saying this only because he is my my husband. Also, uh, he really helped us a lot. So, um, among us should have been another colleague of us, Godika Plyashu, also a PhD, also from the institute. Unfortunately, she couldn't join us for uh, yeah personal reasons. Her mother was not feeling well at all. So. So while there, why did I choose to, to write an LTEG application? And to be very honest, this was because, mainly because it's a very straightforward application, application procedure. Um, it it uh, offers opportunity to get on to sites relevant for specific research topics. And Pianosa was, as you will see uh, further, 
very relevant for what we do on daily basis in the institute. So my institute, as, as its name uh, suggests, is um, focused on underground ecosystems and uh, habitats, so caves and uh, um, yeah, underground uh, habitats. Uh, also, I found out while while writing the application that uh, the communication with the both the host and the tech people was also very straightforward and easy, uh, and they were all very helpful while I was writing the application. And also, the the reporting procedure at the end of the mission is very friendly as well. Uh, so this is why I chose Altev, and why did I chose Pianosa? So the site I wanted to to visit, uh, I wanted also to complement uh, our uh, daily research. So the site uh, was necessarily to, to be limestone, to be karstic, to present caves and caverns, so underground habitats. Uh, to be small uh, in order to cover as many habitats as possible and to be relevant to see the dif potential differences in between the sites depending on various uh, parameters such as uh, climatic and uh, or the chemical parameters. And also while, uh, while uh, studying uh, the literature, on Pianosa, um, I I saw that there is a huge lack of information on both its uh, microorganisms and the invertebrates. Actually, there is not much written on Pianosa's biology. It's a lot on its climate, geology, and so on, but not so much on uh, on the biology. And also important, we don't have to be hypocrites. Uh, Italy, Ireland. So this sounds good always, should be wonderful. And we know that uh, good food is also available there. So that also contributed, but uh, less than the first reasons. So after deciding for Pianosa, we contacted the hosts, uh, we wrote the project and uh, the project was, uh, was the had the deadline on uh, December the 23rd, 2020. And uh, we got the acceptance letter on March 2021. So actually we didn't got the acceptance uh, letter because the email just uh, went into the spam or I don't know what what uh, happened to it. Fortunately, I I wrote to the to the LTEC staff asking, what about my project? Because I understood that either yes or no, I, I should get an answer. And uh, they forwarded me the, the email informing that I was accepted, that the project was accepted. And then uh, the pandemic was still on. And so the sampling campaign couldn't occur until May this year. So they were two years of delay, which, uh, yeah, we couldn't help it. Sometimes things are like this. So the project was was entitled Factors Influencing Biodiversity in Underground Habitats from Pianosa Island. Um, we call it in short Cavern Biodiv. And it has as an aim the investigation of the biodiversity and food webs of underground habitats, both caves and caverns, in relation to substrate physical chemical properties, climate variables, and anthropogenic impact. Um, I have to say here that Pianosa Island as a whole is very uh, impacted by humans. I don't think there are much sites left to, as they used to be. We also had some general objectives to inventory the microbial and invertebrate community of the island, underground habitats of the island, to document differences in structure and diversity of underground microbiome, as well as in uh, invertebrate communities, depending on climatic variables, and to assess how tourism and or agriculture impact on the target, uh, target uh, habitats. The specific objectives were to identify the microbial species, to identify the main invertebrate 
invertebrates groups, and this is something we, we did, uh, number two, uh, to assess taxatrophic level position within communities and establishing potential differences in the microbial and invertebrates abundance and richness between pristine and human modified areas. We still have to work on, on several of these uh, topics. So we set uh, on our road, we, we used, we came there by car. We knew that we are that we are not allowed to travel uh, by car. The cars usually are not uh, allowed on the island. The island, as a whole, is a natural reserve. So um, uh, then we were told that a very small number of cars are permitted, and we can come by car. But we already set our minds on the bicycle. Bicycles, since the the island is pretty small, it only has about ten kilometers square kilometers, and uh, yeah, we like uh, bicycle all of us. Um, to get to the piano, so we we took the opportunity to to and took some some days off, and we also visited a little bit of the cities we encountered on our on our road. And so we visited Florence, Pisa, and Laghi, and which is a very small medieval, uh, medieval uh, village. It's absolute, uh, absolutely a jewel. About Florence and Pisa, I'm I'm sure that everybody knows more. Um, yeah, in Laghi, Laghi is very well known because of this uh, um, factory of pasta factory. And we tasted the pasta they do. It's it's a place to go. So after um, crossing Tuscany, we arrived to Pianos Island. And the target sites were, as I said already, service environments from pristine and human modified areas, as well as caves and caverns in cliffs and rocky waterfronts exposed to to sea climate so we choose we we choose this island because of what the literature said and the uh, according to the literature uh, pianosa had was very rich in caves and caverns uh, both inland as well as on the coast uh, literature unfortunately did not concord with the reality so we had a very bad surprise that uh, we didn't find uh, find almost. Uh, I, I cannot say no no real caves or caverns. They were some, but um, nothing that we we imagined. So we had to adjust, and as a consequence, we we established to sample also in long time abandoned buildings as analogs of underground sites. It's not the same. We are aware of this, but. Um, we we thought that it's also an interesting topic to go on, um, especially because this sampling, uh, this uh, long abandoned buildings, had used to have very different uh, destinations. One of which here in the north was a hospital, a former hosp hospital. Um, several others were well, various had various destinations. I have to say here, for those who do not know, but I, I uh, strongly advise people to read a little bit about uh, Pianosa Island because it's a very interesting history it has. Uh, until 19, 1986, I think, it used to be a prison for maxi maximum security. And this was lasting since uh, 18th uh, something. Um, okay, so here is us uh, in the study setting uh, traps for the invertebrates. Galuka, uh, Catalina, and Vlad. This is how the traps were were uh, looking like. There's like small beakers um, in the that we put in the in the earth in the ground. Uh, covered with a plastic in order not for the the again not to fill them up. Um, the traps contained a uh, liquid which we we used 
uh, antifreezer because of the ethylene glycol that attracts invertebrates. This is the the team uh, on the bikes uh, on the bicycles uh, moving from one side to another. And here is how we sampled in the long abandoned uh, in the long abandoned uh, buildings. Up there, the two uh, frog, uh, frog, uh, sampling for uh, egg borne microorganisms. And this is the former hospital in the north of the island. And this one is a building in the old harbor, which actually has, it's like a cave or a cavern uh, in, in uh, Gok. And it only has built these uh, walls at the at, at the front of the cave. And yeah, here we set some uh, some uh, petri dishes with uh, growing media for both fungi and uh, bacteria. The caves, I only put some two, two examples, La Lavandekia Vecchia, which is this, as well as Goethe de Chegbi, again, sampling. So the samples we took was uh, airborne microorganisms, sediments, Raluca uh, also sampled the invertebrates she found, and um, yeah, the sediments as well, and scraps from the walls, walls, ceilings, different substrates. What we got, so these are just some of the of the cultures we obtained from the airborne microorganisms, from the catacomb, Gota de Cegvi, Lavandegia Vecchia. So this is just to uh, give you the flavor of our work. And what we do now is to isolate each of those colonies and to molecularly analyze them. In terms of invertebrates, so this is, we, we have now an evidence of how many of the richness and uh, abundance of uh, invertebrates uh, groups uh, in the four habitats existing on the islands, meaning uh, namely pine forest, pastures, makis and olive trees. And we are still, uh, my colleagues are still uh, working on the identification at the species level of all the, the invertebrates found. In terms of nuisances and, uh, and um, um, issues, um, so we were not happy at all about the delay, but this was due to pandemic. It, you couldn't do anything uh, against it. Uh, it was a very bad surprise, the fact when we got there and we saw that actually they are not the, the sites we, we thought we will find. So the fact that the data is not consistent with the field to gear situation uh, was something that uh, didn't make us happy again. And uh, I cannot I cannot not mention the ticks. So it was, uh, we were... Uh, advised at the beginning, so we were told that there are ticks on the islands, but we never imagined how many ticks could be. So, um, yeah, it was it was difficult uh, dealing with the ticks, but fortunately, none of us got bitten, and uh, none also from uh, of the members of the host team. In terms of great things to be mentioned, were the hosts. And I acknowledge here everybody from the Institute of Bioeconomy, which was most helpful and joyful and made our stay there um, a real joy. Uh, they offered us uh, the coordinates of their sites, sites that uh, are monitored since decades now. So they will, um, they will uh, provide us with their data and we will, uh, combine our data with their data and fortunately it will come out a, a nice uh, nice uh, results. The accommodation conditions were also perfect and most of uh, all the spirit and the mood. So it was a joy sharing the research station with this Italian team. It was really nice.
And we still have to analyze molecularly the microorganisms in order to, to see exactly what the species or the, the community of both fungi and uh, fun fungi and the bacteria um, make uh, made up the microbiome of the island. We have to finish the identification of the invertebrate to interpret the data and fortunately to write a paper or two. Uh, we plan to, to apply for the follow-up project. And in this follow-up project, we will target uh, the caves and caverns that are accessible from sea. Our permit did not, um, the permit we had uh, did not allow, allow us to, to go by boat in those caves and caverns. And um, yeah, we would like to sample from the also from the same sites, but in the different season. At uh, the the original application, actually, uh, folks saw uh, two two sampling campaigns, one in May and one in October. Uh, only one of those was uh, was uh, allowed. Was and in conclusion, LTA missions is something I would recommend to everybody. It's a great experience. It's the the opportunity to get successful projects, successful in terms of results, and it's a wonderful networking opportunity. And so, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander, for this interesting and inspiring presentation. And I think it shows nicely how uh, a, a TA project can add for the research done at the site as here, adding the biological information for, for the others. Um, and this yeah. makes a nice bridge for, uh, for hearing a little bit more about what benefits there are for a site from receiving the TA, TA visitors. And Mihai Adamesko from Romania will, will have a little note on, on this. Hi. Hello. I hope you can hear me. We can. Yeah. First of all, I, it's it's always a pleasure to see all of you and um, and to say something about uh, the other side, the side of uh, receiving so many uh, guests and so many uh, nice teams that are doing research in in these uh, TAs. Um, I was trying to find out uh, if uh, my presentation from the last year, but then I realized this is a new year, so no need for that. Um, we had several teams uh, visiting us, and I remember uh, most of them, not all, but most of them. Uh, this year, for example, we had uh, somebody from uh, from Finland, and they were uh, doing um, uh, nice research in, in the Braila Island and also in other parts uh, in, in Europe. Uh, they were heading to Israel, uh, but unfortunately they, they uh, didn't uh, get to that part yet. Uh, so from, my, from our part, I think uh, it's a very good, um, uh, let's say it's a very good opportunity, uh, first of all, to share uh, uh, what we have in terms of infrastructure because in this moment we have a lot of infrastructure in, in, uh, in our sites um, and we are using, uh, uh, we have also a lot of uh, background uh, variables to, to give to the, uh, to the uh, TA uh, participants as a support for their uh, research. Um, and I think this is, this is important uh, not only uh, for us, but also for, for the visiting uh, TAs. Um, I think also that uh, for us, um, it, it's not, not necessary. Um, we, we are preparing for the visit. We are uh, doing our best in order to, to host in good condition uh, everybody. And actually, we are making friends. And this is uh, and nice teams uh, in different uh, places in Europe. And this is actually uh, an, another issue that I want to, to share. We are developing even projects together after that. So I think this is uh, the added value. I mean, one of the added values is that we are uh, increasing the value of the network by uh, having these TAs. Um, and usually, I, you know, that I always ask uh, what is the value of the of the ELTR. 
uh, as a network. And I think one of the biggest successes of the ELTR, and not only, uh, of this kind of networks is actually the idea of transnational access uh, and making uh, people travel uh, and uh, making acquaintances and also uh, uh, bonding uh, across uh, across so diverse uh, um, uh, landscapes and type of ecosystems and also people. And I think this is uh, the added value of the of the um, TA. So yeah. This is from my side. If you have any questions about uh, about this, uh, I will be more than happy. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yeah, for, for for make the TA program run, we need both the sites that are hosting and receiving the visitors, and then the researchers who are interested on traveling and mm -hmm. having their projects done in in different different sites. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left and we can use this time for for questions if you have any practical questions regarding applying for TA project or if you have questions for Alexandra Kevin about their projects or or whatever is is in your mind.